welcome to All Write in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair. This recording takes place online with safe physical distancing. Our featured guest today is Margaret Newton. Margaret Newton received an MFA in creative writing and a PhD in English and linguistics from the University of Minnesota. She is currently a professor of English and American Indian Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee where she also serves as the director of the Electa Quinney Institute for American Indian Education. She is the author of Bowaimo, A Dialect of Dreams in Anishinaabe Language and Literature and Wawene, Wayne State University Press 2015, a collection of bilingual poems in Ojibwe and English. Her poems and essays have been anthologized and published in New Poets of Native Nations, Sing, Poetry from the Indigenous Americas, Poetry, the Michigan Quarterly Review, Waterstone Review, and Yellow Medicine Review. She is co-editor of the papers of the Algonquin Conference and is an advocate for education and community engagement through relevant research and teaching. Welcome, Margaret. Miigwetchen, thank you. It's nice to be with you. In the foreword to this book, you talk about how we're all trained by our language to hear the world in a certain way. Would you like to share your thoughts on how this works with our audience? I think that particular example I was using related to the title of the book, Gijigijiganeshi Gikendan. So Gijigijiganeshi is our way of saying chickadee in Anishinaabe Mwen. And we often get taught to hear the world around us a certain way. There's patterns that become familiar. So you could argue that it goes both ways. Um, arguably the very first person that said Gidja Gidja and Kineshi was hearing that and created the word. But now for the rest of us, now that that word already exists, when we learn it, it becomes what we hear when we're out listening to chickadees. Some of us may also hear chickadee dee dee. It depends on which you're used to. So I think that we just have to be mindful about the delights of linguistic diversity and how multiple ways of hearing the world around us can be really beneficial. Oh, doors opening all the time, I think. How do you think that that process impacts our relationship to the world and to each other? I think that for all of us, there are ways to think differently and when we use our language, we're making choices. So we, we learn very, very early on as little children that the words we choose do matter. Um, we might say that uh, words can be overcome, that we know that substance is different, but then poems get written and songs get written and words take on meaning and they, they are associated with feelings and ideas. And in many ways, I think our words can shape the world around us. So what we choose to use as a language shapes who we are. And I think the languages we tolerate in the use, in, you know, in the world around us that the others can use are um, important to keep in mind. So whether or not we think it's okay to have people speaking a language nearby us that we don't understand, or would we try to learn that? How do we respond to words that we don't use commonly? I think those all are questions that tell us a lot about who we are. And with the book, I really just wanted to invite everyone who lives in the Great Lakes region, specifically places like Michigan, and you think of Illinois, Minnesota, there's many, many places in the US now where those words have so much more meaning than people often get to know. So we'd like to have more people think about words differently. How would you describe the way the Anishinaabe language blends philosophy and science and psychology, which is something you explore in the first section of your book? Again, I think languages are, you know, in some ways our first libraries. The ways that we describe the world and the words that we build 
are the ways that we remember things. So if we are trying to think of a concept like in Anishinaabe, when the word for east is wabanong, uh, to be in the east, you would say wabanong. But if I was going to talk about seeing, I would say nawab. And that right there would begin to get some science behind that. And you start thinking, well, do I need the light that comes from the East to see? And you would think about how color works and how your eyes work. There are many paths you could go down as you sort of unpack the etymology of words. And it's true in every single language, every language that humans choose to use, they're combining meanings in different ways. So when you get to know one language, so for us, for Anishinaabem, when there are many scientific concepts embedded in our words, I think, because we wanted people to remember those ideas. Wasnode as a term for the northern lights. Um, you hear in that word uh, idea of light and sound and being uh, something very distant. And when you actually study what causes the northern lights, um, I remember a few years ago reading a news article where someone wrote they had discovered there were sound, sounds that were emitted at the base of the northern lights when those magnetic waves were encountering our planet. And I thought, wow, you know, the ancestors had a sense of that. There's ways that bits of science became obvious to some observer at some point in time and then are encoded in the language. So it's not that one word is more right than others. Certainly the Northern Lights tells us something in English as well. But I think when we pay attention to how words have been put together, um, it will tell us a lot. And in, I recognize that in your question, you asked about philosophy as well as science. And I think that uh, in terms of the philosophy, we think in English of ways of thinking, branches of thinking, philosophy and science are separate in English. But I think in Nanda Gekendan, to observe closely is something that encompasses both in Anishinaabemwin. So I think just even the intellectual tradition is a little bit different in Anishinaabemwin. Again, not making a qualitative judgment. I, I actually am glad I have multiple languages to use to think about the world. But I often think people really miss the huge um, maps of ways of knowing that are in our indigenous languages that have not been, you know, kept as present in the American mind. There are a number of languages that we have um, let go and lost and we would need to work to get them back in the US. Um, hopefully those that are a little bit stronger can stay strong and some of the others can come back. So when you were writing What the Chickadee Knows, you conceived each poem first in Anishinaabe and then in English. What was that process like? What kind of challenges did that present? I would say that my journey to writing these poems begins with uh, multiple things. One being a kid and walking around with my dad who would listen to the birds and answer the birds in their language. We would learn to understand when he was mimicking a bird and calling a bird or when he was using a call that was intended for my sister and I and it meant come home for dinner, you know? So learning to use language differently and learning to think about birds as having their own language is something that uh, I think I was lucky enough to be invited to do at a very, very early age. Then as I grew older and got much more interested in the linguistics of Ojibwe in particular, because where I was growing up in Minnesota at the time, it was a language we were working hard to revitalize. I found that these were separate things. So I would write poems in English, but I would study Ojibwe language and I wanted to find a way to connect them. So even then when I was pursuing an MFA, I wrote a lot of poems in the language, but at the time people said, no one will want to read those. Just use a word here or there. If you want to be published, you have to write mostly in English. And I, I believed it. So I'm here to say to young poets, do not believe what you are told to do ever. <laughs> you know, Do the thing that makes sense to you because I knew as a learner and as someone who wanted to keep the language going, I needed to use Ojibwe as the main language. So Ojibwe, Anishinaabemwin, whichever term that you use, Anishinaabemwin is sort of a blanket term that includes Odawa, Potawatomi, and Ojibwe. After a while, I sort of gave myself permission, perhaps as an older person, I said, no, I'm just going to do what I think I need to do. 
And that was to write first in an Anishinaabe one, because if people are careful readers, and even if they don't know the language, but sound them out, you can see the rhythm, the pattern, the line lengths, the sounds that I'm playing with in Anishinaabe one are a little bit richer and more complex. And the English is a, is a nice approximation, but the more complicated poem would be the one that I wrote first in Anishinaabe one, and then I do my best to give it a reasonable representation in English. Well, you actually led right into the next question. Um, what kind of poetic tradition were you working with when you were writing in the original language? Well, I'd say two things. I mean, one would be the fact that I have always had elders tell me, elders as in my own parents, my grandparents, or when you hear elders saying, now this is a story from long, long ago, and you know that what they mean is a story that's been handed down through large expanses of time, um, that you really listen to the whole world around you. So in one sense, that's a bit of a rhetorical audio kind of tradition to follow. And if you're in North America, obviously the Great Lakes, um, that confluence you have right at now in English, it's called Walpole Island, but the Kejuanong, um, First Nation over there, right in between Canada and the US, right at the edge of Detroit and Windsor, you know, that becomes a tradition. If the Kejuanong is the place where the waters do a certain thing, some of those sounds and ideas, I think, get written into our poetry. On the other hand, I've also had a lot of fun translating Chaucer and Hafez and any number of poets that have spanned different centuries and their traditions um, influence my work as well. So I would not say that I ever try to stay within one space. Um, I really look at all the ways that I've encountered that humans have tried to delight one another or uh, question one another or challenge or you know, I suppose even sometimes frighten one another into thinking something they wouldn't have thought until they read that poem that you might have given them. I just have to say I love the work that you're doing. I mean I've always been fascinated personally by the way that different languages represent the same sound. Even the the call of a rooster in different European languages is kokoriko or kikiriki, aka doodle do and and one thing, but to keep these indigenous languages alive is such important work, whether in the U.S. or in Canada or anywhere in the Americas, and I'm just so glad that you're doing this. So winter and the silence of winter is an important idea in the book. When you're writing, how did you think about sound and the absence of sound? Yeah, that's interesting that you say that, um, and I would sort of you know, back up maybe a step to say that uh, I really appreciate your interest and recognition that that doing this work is actually supporting languages and trying to move them forward. Because until some of the things that, you know, colleagues my age or other folks that I know are working in language revitalization were doing this, I really felt a lot of indigenous languages were anchored in the past. So even if I mess up or people don't like my poems, at least it's creative use that's moving forward. So, so I really do appreciate when people are willing to just take that leap of faith and say, here's a language I don't know, but I'm gonna let someone play with it. Um, and the question about winter is such a good one because it's about balance and it's about thinking through all the things that that word means. So if I were to ask you, which I realize is impolite, Ani and Daso Bibonagizian, how old are you? <laughs> you could tell me Nishitana Daso Bibonagizian, I'm still 20 or something, you know, whatever you want to say. But I think that uh, when we think of the way we are in the world, just to ask someone the equivalent of the English term, how old are you? We're using language that says, how many winters have you seen? And we think of winter as a storytelling time and as a time to pause. And the word for fall, dagwagen, is a time that things are sort of cut short and change. And then you get into bibon, which is winter, and that's when things just sort of stop a bit. And in that is the implication that you would slow down and that you would hear and you might be present and be listening and be silent. Um, I really do think that one of the things that the world needs to remember is to slow down, 
we are in a pandemic that has maybe reminded of us, the, us of that in a way that has not been pleasant. But I do think that there is a lot of balance to be found in our seasons, our cycles through life, um, different ages that people are. So when I feel like writing about winter, it's also about aging. It's about holistic kind of ideas of well-being, when to stop, when to listen, when to follow, how to, um, how to balance the things that you see around you. In one poem, you talk about the simple act of making strawberry jam as thick with wisdom. How do you view the importance of tradition and culture in everyday things? Oh yeah, that poem, I think of my friends that I wrote it for. So Chibanesi, Buck, Jim Northrup, and his wife, Umpala Stewin, Pat Northrup, they had a household that was just incredible. Um, it blended Dakota and Ojibwe traditions. And they were always doing things that seemed to kind of exist in no time and then be right there at the kitchen table. It was this just wonderful mix of participating in life beyond just what the human defines. So they might be making birch baskets or finishing some wild rice or making strawberry jam. And it really reminds you that something as simple as putting your own food on the table or gifting that food to someone else is an immediate thing and it satisfies sort of your hunger and it delights your tongue and it, it makes you think of certain things, but it's also such an ancient practice to gift food to someone else, to say to them, I, I care not only that you have something to eat, but that I make it a beautiful something for you to eat, a sweet something to eat. Um, so I always felt that everything they did, they were always mixing wisdom in with what they were doing. Um, so yeah, I think that when we do those simple things, it can mean so much more than we realize, I think, at the moment. Yeah. You know, you also talked a little bit earlier about that telling tales, the Anishinaabe way in the winter. You know, that was one of the lines out of your poems. Could you talk a little bit more about the role of storytelling in the culture and sort of the, the specific approach to it that the culture sure. takes? Yeah, so stories, um, I teach the language and I connect with an elementary school where we've got kids who are very, very little. We have some parents who believe they should start speaking language to their babies before they're born, right? So you have a sense that language and telling stories is a way of being in the world. And very early on when I'm teaching the language, I tell folks there's two ways to talk about stories. So the one way, if you say debajim, I'm just telling the news, debajim, gajway, bukjanag, well, like I'm just gonna tell you what happened yesterday, maybe. Something that I would definitely know, I probably witnessed, or somebody very near to me told me, and you have a sense that I might know whether or not it's true. But the other kind of story, I could say, gajway, gajway, bukjanag, mewenja, if I'm talking about that, it's, it's a type of storytelling that is making sense of the world, helping to understand the world. It's making, kind of narrating what is happening in a way that holds a different layer of meaning. And it implies that it's something that has been constructed within a community. Uh, and those stories are animate. The news type stories are inanimate. So you get a couple of concepts about storytelling. One, that there's really only two main kinds, not fiction, horror, romance, nonfiction, all the kinds that we've created in English, which as an English professor, I, I delight in those. But for Anishinaabe literature, there's really just two kinds, the inanimate kind, the animate kind, and your relationship with those type of stories is very different. And in those types is the assumption that they are situated in like a little web of knowing. So if I had a student that I was teaching in Ojibwe class to tell stories, I would give them points for plagiarism. I would say the more people that you can tell me you heard this story from, the better. If you can say some of the exact ways you heard it, that's great. 
if you add just a, the tiniest spin to something that's already been told, even better, right? Because it, it sort of knits you into that web of understanding those old stories, which is very different than what we do in English, which is you must come with, up with something completely new and unique that no one's ever thought or said before. And, you know, it's just two different ways of being, different traditions, different ways of valuing story. I think in, in English, though, we do know many of our stories are layered and many of the finest poets and authors have been, you know, hearkening back to other stories they already heard. But we expect it to be original and new, and it has a sort of a different way of um, being put forth. So storytelling in those two ways, um, those are significant things to think about. The other, I guess the other piece of that as well um, is that our idea of truth and knowledge, if you say, are, is something true? Deb Wemagut enough? I'm just going to ask you, is that true? Deb Wemagut enough? And I, and I would say in deb way, I'm trying to be correct or actual. If I said in deb weta, I believe you. So you can hear in those words that this same sound is being repeated, which gives the sense that in Anishinaabem, when telling an accurate story is synonymous with being correct, with being truthful, with being honest. It means that, you know, if you're telling that type of story, it's believable. So because the word for believe and true and correct are all part of our word for that type of story, it implies what you need to be doing in that type of story is sharing some kind of truth. Could be that you're using metaphor and you're making things up, but you should be at the heart of it doing something that is revealing some form of truth. Um, and, I, and all of those things are, if they gradually, if I have students that are learning the language, they may, they may take a semester and never come back or never become fluent, but I know that what they take away from that is a sense of how we tell our stories into the world and how different cultures have done that over time. That is just fascinating. And I, I love the idea, again, without uh, attaching any value, that one culture storytelling uh, prioritizes individualism, more or less, and the other is more about community. How very, very interesting. So, in The Surging Sea, a poem about Angelique Leroy, or Leroy, if we anglicize it, who was born in 1766, you talk about the earth changing on waves of trade, and that dreaming is more difficult on the other side of the Western break. In your view, what was the impact of the beaver trade on indigenous peoples or European cultural influence? Yeah, that's a huge question. And I think I try sometimes to get at these things in poems in whatever way that I can. Um, I have another poem called The Time of Confusion that's told from the perspective of a beaver <laughs> during, during the trade era, um, because there are a lot of journals from this time Many of them obviously are coming from the side of the people who would have long had literacy and they're keeping records and they're writing things down. So most of the maps and most of the records are coming from the people who came over here from another space to trade. And we really don't have the story the squirrels might have told or the beavers would have told. And I think in many ways, although we know Angelique Leroy and others like her, were very involved in economic policy making, uh, the way that business happened, the way that alliances were made. We don't really have their version of the stories either. So I think very often when I think of the time of trade, there were good things that came out of it. I mean, entire, when you think of the Métis nation, right? You have people and diasporas who have combined cultures in ways that are new, cultures that are not the same as if you were in France, not the same as if you had just stayed in a closed Ojibwe or Anishinaabe society. So you can't really ever say that it should not have happened or we need to go back or something. That's just not possible. So I think the time of trade did some amazing, incredible things and created something new in many ways, but it also did a lot of harm. And I think it, it did a lot of erasing. Um, so when we think of really all of what was New France and what uh, people were recording in the Jesuit relations, what we think would have been going on in Detroit in the 1700s, that 
was a time of sort of cosmopolitan equality that ended pretty disastrously and pretty abruptly. And so I, I try sometimes to allude a little bit to that history just to get people thinking about it because we can't rewrite history, but we can reconstruct history and we can remember it differently. And I think the more that we do that, the more we can learn from it uh, in a more full and complete way, I guess. In Writing Away, you talk about us being in need of stories to make America great again. What kind of stories would those be? Well, I, I would have to say that I try very hard to never alienate any readers. And I always try to imagine um, people, even those who might be most like me in political views and most unlike me in political views. And when you hear phrases sort of bandied about and you know people go back and forth, I felt like in some ways that was a phrase that I saw in the media, make America great again. And it meant one thing to some people and it meant something entirely different to other folks. And I think there was a time where there was a lot of opposition. Are we for that? Are we against it? And really for many people in indigenous communities, that's a wonderful phrase, but we mean a long, long time ago, right? <laughs> you know. So when you think about when might this continent have been at its greatest, when did it sustain people in a way that was least harmful to all living beings alive? You know, when you think of the way the women of the Ohio Valley were managing forests and fields and feeding huge numbers of people with their agricultural skill and bringing different cultures together or the people who built Cahokia, you know, like, that's what I mean, make America great. You're like, I think there are points that sometimes when we say America, you know, what do we mean by that? We need to include all the points in history. It could be the 1940s when, you know, certain people were born or lived. Um, I know that there are points of my parents and grandparents' lives that they might want to go back to, and I might want to visit them with them. But I think there's also times that could be thousands of years ago that could have been quite incredible that we are not always including in our history when we say, let's go back a bit in time. Would you like to read a little bit of your work for us? A couple of poems. I can. Um, I'm not sure if you have things that you want in particular or you want... What, I mean, what? in some ways, I feel like some of what you brought up might be worth. So there's one that I always think that's um, fun since you did bring it up. Um, it's the one about the strawberry jam. And I'm always fond of that because the, it reminds me of my friends, uh, Jim and Pat. So I'll, I'll read that one, but this is maybe another, it ties to some of your other comments and questions. Because I wrote it in Anishinaabemwin, you can hear that in Anishinaabemwin, there are ways that the lines blend together. And in fact, I sort of wrote it to be as a song a bit. I can't do that in English. So I can uh, read you the English. Maybe I'll read the English first so people know what they're hearing. And then I'll, I'll give it to you in Anishinaabemwin. So this is the one that's named for Pat, whose Dakota name is Ampawa Stewin, Daybreak Woman. And uh, it, here it is in English. She makes strawberry jam, mixing sweet wind and shining water with thick wisdom, pounding, measuring, everything we've cared for, everything we've lost, the songs we have not yet sung, the feathers yet to decorate, and all the ways we've smiled into jars filled to the brim to be open when we are thin, sleeping deeply in winter near where the tomatoes once grew. Gakina ga jau en mang gidwa, gakina ga wani yang gidwa. Naga mawen an kwa naga mahu yang, ni gwa na kwa waji yang gidwa. E ji jong ning gwe angoba, mushkin e mudaya bikong, 
Jeba pakanet, jeba kade yam, bo sangwame yam, bebun besho, ko ogani kendaji kenebiko. So hopefully it, it sounds a little bit more interesting in a Nishnabim one because you could tell maybe that I was playing with certain words and, and I could get patterns and rhythms in a Nishnabim one that when I turn to give them an English equivalent, I can't do quite the same thing in English, but it's because it was a poem, a poem that was just born in a Nishnabim one. Um, I don't know if you want me to do um, another one. I could do the, yes, please. Um, the chickadee one. Yes, please. I find that one here. I think I've got it. Um, I also maybe have the, I have it in the book, which I will say, Wayne State did such a nice job of, and I have an older daughter, um, I asked her to draw me something, my older daughter, whose name is Shannon, and I asked her to just draw one chickadee for the cover. But she drew three chickadees and they actually used it. So that was kind of nice um, to see it come, come to life in that way. So the chickadee poem, if you know chickadees, uh, they have a certain call. And in particular, at the end of the day, they kind of call out to each other. And that's something I was thinking of when I came up with this particular little poem because I wanted to see, could I write something maybe for the chickadees? I understand that a, I would try and write these things down and mostly humans read them, but I tried to think of the chickadees in, in some ways as the audience as well. And I was trying to teach, since we have a moment in this format, I was trying to teach folks between some parallels. So Aniko Bijigana and Aniko Bidoa, you can hear that they have this Aniko, this concept that is repeating, and that's actually connecting. So Aniko Bidon means to tie something together, but it also is the word we use for great grandparents. So that's a little bit of a parallel. Another one that's in here is Manito, and there are many places. I believe there's even one restaurant chain that has a Manitou sandwich, and there are Manitou Islands, and there's Manitoba the province, right? So Manitou is a really common word of ours that just pops up in all kinds of places. And people they have come over time to sort of know it means spirit, but I think that the full extent of what it can mean isn't always played with or fully understood. So that last line where it says Manitokeyung Manadoyang is showing how you can use that idea of a spirit both to have a ceremony to make a spirit or have something be spiritual, but also be alive in a different way. You could also have Geshemanido and say that's the great spirit as well. So there's just a lot of ways to use that word. So in English, the poem is the ancestors tied and extended it, the sweet grass telling us make bundles, the world is not yet ripe. The marsh chickadee is there in the white pine, calling out, wanting to be with us. It's a ceremony, a way to be alive. So hopefully in English it sounds okay, but there are things that are lost. So even the line, Gijigijikaneshi, Eyagawanda, that leaves the chickadee and the white pine as equal. So it sounds in a Anishinaabe as if I'm saying, hey chickadee, look, there's a white pine, or hey, pine, look, there's a chickadee. It doesn't clarify, it leaves that ambiguous, but the English kind of locks it down, making it seem a little more clear because in English, it's uh, the syntax kind of requires that. Uh, there's another one that's in here that's about the peepers, um, which if I were going to say that I wanted to involve you, I could do that, right? So there's several of you there, <laughs> right? So this is a little poem that it ends with the uh, sound bipagi. So you guys can help be the, the chorus. And if you're doing this on Zoom, I will say one thing about the Zoom universe we've all learned to exist in is that you have the ability to have your sound off and be as loud as you like. So I now tell people we have no need for everyone to necessarily turn their sound on. 
But if anyone's watching this anywhere later, or those of you that are on the call with me now, we can see from your lips if you participate and just do that. You know, I think it's a, a really nice thing that people can be in their own space and be as loud as they want. So I'll read three short lines and then you can chime in on the last line, which is repeating bit boggy, bit boggy. And it has four sections. So we'll just try this, interactive poetry, right? <laughs> I'll read it, uh, we'll just do it in the language first and then I can go through and tell folks what it means. Ishkwa bibun biomagak gawin geave abta neboka mushkawi siwat bipagi bipagi and this is how it would sound if peepers did it right just like that then the next verse is namas asijwanek agozemaki gi ningisiyang ni nopodoreyang mashkegong bipagi it bishko did a bashka, jawis visa, zogpok, zigwang, zibiskach, midash, bitbang, bitbang, a pitchy, mad ogoyang, besh gonna wab megak, awiyang, was gonna wab megak, awiyang, bitbang, it's nice that it just sounds exactly like spring peepers when you go by and they're just popping up all over. So in English, what it says is after the winter to tie back to one of the other questions. So after the winter waiting, no longer half frozen by design, our calling becomes all calling. Under the rippling bark, peepers have thawed. They crawl into the swamp where all calling becomes your calling. A seismic sesh, a synaptic snowstorm of springtime repetition, and your calling becomes my calling. As we drift away on echoes, we are the details, we are the distance, and all calling becomes our calling. So that ties, I guess, to a couple of the other themes we brought up. I think I have a lot of, a lot of water, a lot of waves, um, a lot of our Great Lakes Basin in my poems that I can't take credit for it. It's just there. It's been there 10,000 years. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think that was the first for us on the podcast to have yes. a participatory poem. <laughs> so that was fun. <laughs> so, well, thank you very, very much for joining us today. We were all fascinated by your book and the ideas in it. And it was, it's just a lovely read. Thank you so much. It's nice to be with you. And thank you all so much for great questions and for caring about Ojibwe poetry. We that are good. fantastic. That was thank awesome. Thank you so yes. much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really interesting. Thank you. And thank you for yeah. what you're doing. It's really important. Yes, it is. We, yeah, just, we just loved this book. It was really, really oh, awesome. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. good. It's nice. Yeah. Well, I always say, you know, on the path to becoming a professor, you end up doing a lot of things and a lot of publishing, but these little thin volumes of Ojibwe poems have possibly been the most rewarding. <laughs> oh, I can imagine. <laughs> Don't tell the editors of the literary theory journals, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, well, no, but you're kind of breaking new ground with them, aren't they? Aren't you? I mean, you're doing something experimental that nobody else has ever done. With yeah, there are, there are not a lot of people that I feel have had permission to do what they want in our languages and we're really just at the cusp of it I would say my children and you know for me in my generation there's just a few of us that feel like we got to a point where we're comfortably fluent um, there was such a break between the folks before us and when the language wasn't used and then when we started relearning it we we just felt we had to speak exactly like our elders yeah. I think our kid that next generation not at all they're they're ready and willing to go in new directions so I'm Excited to see what will be out there in, say, 20 years. Um, but yeah, for now, there's not a lot of creative work in our, in our language. Yeah, so the, the next generation will really bring it alive. I'm right? making yeah. clear that they can do it. They do not have to like what I wrote, but they have to know that you can do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Absolutely. Awesome. All languages change naturally, and I love that you're keeping those traditional languages alive, but also giving people permission to continue growing them and develop, developing them and, and making them new. So congratulations on that. Thanks so much for being with us. Yes, thank you guys. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts. Or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, 
sign up to our email list, or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.